Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Reveal Report. I'm your host, George Iceman. Thank you for joining us on this Friday. We are live this weekend, and uh, we're going to have a very interesting talk today. The mysteries that are associated with the Kabbalah. What is Kabbalah, everybody? It's a thing. It's a fad that people are talking about. There's so many books recently about it, but where does it come from? What's its meaning and so forth? We're going to get into that. We're going to discuss that. I first want to begin by saying thank you for joining us and following us on all our social media platforms, which include uh, Telegram, almost 10,000, Twitter, over 12,000. Thank you so much. We are on Instagram, uh, and that's kind of a newer space, about 4,000 there. And of course, here, uh, I think we're just 42 plus thousand, almost 43,000, um, all natural guys, no marketing, no advertising, no promotion, no bots. <laughs> and that's great. And we appreciate that, that it's all real views. We thank you all so much for being here and we appreciate all the love and support. Like, subscribe and share. If you're new and you want to participate in the chat, remember to be kind and courteous to everyone that is in the chat and you have to subscribe to type into the box and uh, let your voice be heard. Thank you very much, guys. And without further ado, let me bring on my panel and my guests. First is my co-host, who is an author of several books. You can find some of her books, of course, on uh, Amazon. And uh, she has a great ministry, uh, and I want to bring her on. This is Jesse Zaboder. Jesse, how are you? Welcome back. Hey, great, George. Good to be here. And next, we have an amazing author uh, who has traveled um, with us to do some speaking engagements. Uh, it was a great time in Orlando. He's working on his second book. I believe it is finished. And it's, uh, it's, it's at the brink of coming out. And I was lucky enough and blessed to see the, see the contents and see the cover. Very exciting for his new book. Please welcome Mr. Gary Wayne. Well, thank you for inviting me back. And uh, yeah, the uh, the book is is finished. It's uh, going to be a little bit longer, though. We got some pretty disappointing news. We were trying to hit deadlines. Uh, we missed, uh, I guess, the catalog advertising. So between that and to get it promoted properly, but also there's a shortage in the uh, printing industry in terms of paper and labor. Mm and printers <laughs> so we've put in for our march 12th release date and we're going to have hopefully have the book available sooner and i'll make it as soon available as soon as it's possible but what you can't do is is miss a, a release date for amazon uh, and if you do they punish you not just the author but every book that's sold by the publisher so wow well, there you have it, guys. So just hold tight. I'm sure the book is going to be well worth it. I was reading the table of context, exciting stuff, and always a wealth of knowledge and a great round table between all three of us. We're going to bring a, a, some different perspectives and discuss this particular topic that a lot of people want to know a little bit more about, which is Kabbalah. I'm going to begin by playing a video. Uh, it pretty much sums up a little bit of what I want to touch and then I'll give everyone an opportunity to comment on what they're seeing. So please turn up your volume, take a look at the screen, I'm gonna play an opening video so we could begin our talks here about the mysteries of the Kabbalah. Here it is. What's the first thing you think of when you hear the word Kabbalah? Maybe Jewish, maybe mysticism, maybe Madonna? Kabbalah is a compilation of written works that explain the ancient secretive beliefs of Jewish mysticism, the name coming from the Hebrew word, meaning to receive. Traditional Kabbalists have gone on to become some of Judaism's greatest sages, and also notorious heretics and pariahs. Its contents have been debated, scrutinized, and studied for centuries. But rabbis have long feared misinterpretation and weaponization of the Kabbalah, and for centuries restricted Kabbalah study to a small number of men deemed worthy. But in recent years, Kabbalah went mainstream. Jews and non-Jews, including some A-list celebrities, swear by it. There are now countless introductory books, including a Kabbalah for Dummies, and establishments teaching Kabbalah are in major cities on practically every continent. Who would like to begin? I guess I can. I'm, you know, with my background in the Luciferian Brotherhood, uh, the Kabbalah was very commonly used. Um, you know, they would use it with a lot of the spells, a lot of the incantations, a lot of uh, preparatory things. 
um, in training with the Solomonic magic and end time event scenarios. Um, so that was something that was very common. You know, I grew up with learning that there's two sides of Kabbalah. You have the light side and the dark side. Uh, the light side is more used for good versus the dark side, uh, which would include like reverse Torah and other things is used for evil and for bad. Um, but it, it gets to be an interesting topic when you really start to break down what is Kabbalah, how, you know, how it works and operates. Uh, from a base understanding, you know, we learned that you have all these letters, but each of those letters and sounds have height, depth, breadth, and width as the Lord spoke them out. And really, you know, there's the belief that there's power as you begin to use um, that height, depth, breadth, and width of each letter or combination of letters uh, together. Gary, what would you like to say about that? Oh, you're muted. Kabbalah is ancient, but not as ancient as the religions. I guess it would be more sort of closely related with in the mystery religions, so to speak. Uh, I think it has a strong influence on Western civilization, um, you know, coming out of uh, Judaic mysticism as opposed to Judaic monotheism. I was interested to note in terms of... Uh, they were using the uh, meaning of the word Kabbalah to mean receive, and that comes. And I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll come. We'll come back to it because it's it's going to have a sense of its underlying sources and meanings and some of the things that they do. So QBL is the vowelless Semitic in Hebrew. Uh, it's a QBAL. And there's two words, one 6901, one 6902. 6901 is the older Hebrew format where it talks about uh, where it's defined as to receive, to, to take, um, and a few other words. But receive is one of the translations that you're going to get in, in, the, in the King James Version Bible. And 6902 is the Aramaic form of the word meaning more restricted to just receiving, although it can also be used uh, to mean take as well, but not as many meanings as the original Hebrew. So it's important to understand that Aramaic was like Greek or Roman in the time of the Persian Empire. It was the transnational, international language of use. And so a lot of the Jewish people lost their uh, written understanding and spoken language of Hebrew, and it was only maintained by the rabbis. And so they learned Aramaic. And whether it's the Targums or many of the Kabbalistic documents um, that were used to define the Bible, which mysticism and Kabbalism comes out of, those are all sort of editorials. And that's why 6902, which is an Aramaic word, as also used in the book of Daniel for receive as well, is an interesting historical intersection to its history and its introduction into Judaism by that Aramaic word that goes along with the Hebrew, word, because the Hebrew word is even older. Wow. Now, for those that are still new, because, you know, we're speaking to everyone as if they kind of know a little bit already about Kabbalah and, and trying to, uh, you know, explain to everybody its, its meaning. But where is its origin? It is said that it is the words of God, the creator, spoken to Moses upon Mount Sinai. And those words that were spoken had life and power. Now, it wasn't documented until a little bit of time after. Uh, they spoke, it was written down and explained and talked about, but it's sort of a, a code that people cannot break. What is this code and what holds within the code? It's almost as if it's written in a way that it's only for people that are special. Like not everyone is able to break this code. And basically the code is to receive knowledge 
wisdom from God, the Almighty. And from my understanding, you prior to maybe 10, 20 years ago, because everything has changed now, of course, you had to be a certain age. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you had to be male. You couldn't be female uh, and study Kabbalah. Kabbalah was um, for men. After a certain age, you were allowed to study it after you studied other things. And then hopefully in your studies and your education, you were able to break this code. To my understanding, a lot of people still have never broke the code, this ancient secrecy and code. So hopefully that kind of informs everybody a little bit of intro of the Kabbalah. I know, Gary, you want to add something? What did you want to say? Because you always have uh, I always have something. So interesting uh, passage in uh, using the old Hebrew form of Kabbalism comes out of Proverbs 1920. And it means to hear counsel and to receive. That's the word Kabbalah. That's their instruction to become wise. So that'll be the sort of the old Hebrew definition they're relying on in conjunction with the connection to receiving this mysticism that they're going to have that is going to come from Babel or Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, while they're in the diaspora, uh, you know, the exile uh, of, uh, of, you know, from, you know, about 589 to about 520 or so on, if I've got the dates right on the, on the history. Mm -hmm. But, and that's where the Aramaic language comes in. They're learning that mysticism, but it's not unknown to them because they're related to another Egyptian religion through the Essenes who actually have a more direct path to that knowledge, but they're going to bring back the Eastern format of that knowledge and, and create mysticism with it. So it's interesting uh, in terms of how they take that knowledge that they receive. And when you look at the code that they're trying to break, that's kind of like a polytheist thing mm. that's trying to, you know, get into the matrix of it, so to speak, to yes. kind of use their language. And I'm not saying that God wouldn't put something in there because he does everything in perfection, whether or not we have the ability to crack it or not. But the thing is, is that number mysticism is the Pythagorean specialty of mysticism that's come down through the mystery schools from the seven sacred sciences from before the flood. And as we get deeper into that, there'll be that connection into that ancient knowledge that they say that they have received. Excellent. Somebody made a comment here. I want to touch on it briefly. Anita says, when I have seen the set of Kabbalah, it looks like the human chakra system mixed with the emotional centers of being human. Interesting, that goes to the tree of life. We'll get there, but I just wanted to bring that up. I want to get back into the, the code and the letters and the wording and so forth. So I'll play another quick clip, and then we can all comment on this to break this down. They'll get a little bit into the coding of it. It's very interesting, so please pay close attention. Here it is. In the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition, there is a highly regarded esoteric text known as the Sefer Yetzra, which translates to the Book of Formation. It delves into the concept of formation within Jewish Kabbalah, specifically on the etheric level, but encompassing the entire process of how things manifest from higher spiritual levels to the physical realm. The Sefer Yetzra explores the structure and formation of things. Within this text, the 22 letters of the classical Hebrew alphabet are discussed. While some modern forms of Hebrew have 27 letters, the classical alphabet consists of 22 letters. In Jewish Kabbalah, these 22 letters are regarded as divine forces, each representing a distinct manifestation of divine energy. 22 letters is the original text there, um, each to manifest this uh, divine energy, God. Comments on that, Jesse? Yeah, you saw, I think it was like the second kind of little uh, clip that they showed there. They showed kind of a circle with all the Hebrew letters around and then like all the intertwining lines. Um, you know, that's a common formation that's used um, 
when you're learning the spiritual gates, the energies, everything that's connected to, um, you know, the universal um, operation of those letters and those sounds. And, you know, what's interesting is you begin to break things down, you realize that, you know, each one is individual, but at the same time, like there's a universal impact with everything that God did. Um, so a lot of that comes out in, you know, particularly the Solomonic magic and learning um, the Kabbalah and stuff that goes with that. So, you know, you've got multi-layered letters. Each one, you know, has a breath sound that, you know, I really break this down in some of my courses too, where we talk about, you know, each letter has either inhale, exhale, then it, within that circular chart, it fits into the universal model, meaning that it, each letter is going to have an octave that it represents in different layers. And based on that layer, you begin to get songs, which, um, you know, when you really study the word, we realize that all of God's word is a song. And he says, all of creation sings his praises. So, you know, each one can probably be more understood as the song that it fits into and how it, you know, has different um, expressions based on where it's placed within the song and whether, you know, it's a major or minor. Um, so it really gets into music when you start to look at the deeper aspect of Kabbalah. Gary, what are your thoughts on what we just discussed? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we need to understand that there are specific numbers assigned to uh, each of the letters and they play a role in all of this. And each letter, you know, because it's thought to be, at least I think in the Jewish tradition, that the Hebrew is, is divine language, that each letter would have special meanings and things. What I picked up out of the video was the number 22. So what's interesting about that is, is most people look at like these the 23, I think, is uh, the number that people like to use for the stars above uh, the Paramount Studios and the mountain of, of Mount Hermon. Um, but what's interesting as well, when they associate each of the letters with a specific higher deity, uh, that seems to be the same number, if you count them, that would be involved with, uh, that, are, that are counted in the Book of Enoch which people will say represent the, the, the stars of, 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 of Mount Hermon. And so you have to actually add another one in there to actually get to the 23. I think there's 23 stars on the, on the Paramount one. But if we start to look at that as, as, as an understanding, we're talking about angels. We're not talking about God of the Bible because we're talking about things that are being taught to uh, the people who study the Kabbalah and all of the, the mystical religions and, and are developing it, they're receiving this stuff, but it's not necessarily receiving from, uh, from God. And that's one of the reasons why we need to test the spirits. And um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We're going to get into that. You know, we're, we're getting there, but I'm glad you mentioned because there's such a dark um, association of black magic with the Kabbalah. And this is going to go very high up. I mean, we're going to talk about some crazy stuff. Um, so I want to get into it. Let me play one more. I want to play one more video. And this is another sector of the Kabbalah, which is the tree of life. We're really getting into this. We're trying to cover it all in one hour, folks, as much as we can and pack it in for you. So let me play this. It talks about the tree of life. Then we're going to get into it. We're going to break it down. I'm going to make some um, association to it. Fascinating stuff. So here is another video, the tree of life side of Kabbalah. Here it is. Glyphs hold pure pattern information, serving as powerful forms of thought from the mind of God. They contain the essence of these patterns, allowing us to discern and become conscious of the impact these beings have on us. Everything in the world originates directly from the mind of God. 
To truly understand the qualities and functions of things in the physical world, including spiritual beings we are constantly connected to, we need guidance. That's where teachings hidden within geometric glyphs come in. One such example is the Tree of Life, which holds an abundance of embedded information. It reveals the coding pattern of energy anchors within the human body. These numbers are associated with specific functions and reflect the divine pattern originating from the mind of God. Thoughts before we get into that? Jesse? Yeah, I mean, I think... It like we were talking about the universal patterns and stuff. Um, you see that in the tree of life. Um, you know, they, in the system, you kind of have this base pattern that they use in the Solomonic magic, which is um, very similar to this, like in your positioning, uh, when you're doing different types of um, rituals and stuff. But um, what's interesting about it is that you know, over and over you see kind of that, what I would call is a base sevenfold pattern uh, that stems from the Holy Spirit of God. And that's kind of the core of that. And, you know, they'll do variants where they add, you know, positions of nine or other things, they'll broaden it out. And where that comes from is, you know, that height, that depth, that breadth, that width of what God has created. So, um, you know, you got to pose that question, like, you know, as they say, as people are going through this, they say there's power in different positions, there's power in the way you stand, power in certain words you say, um, you know, is that true? And did God give us that ability or that authority? Or is there authority behind that? You know, as Gary brought out with, you know, angelic beings or stars that are represented by those sounds, um, is there authority in their name when we, you know, use that? So that, that's kind of the question. And I think the church is afraid to address those questions. They're afraid to have the conversation um, because they don't understand the depth of what God has created or made. Gary, what are your thoughts on um, this discussion of tree of life, um, that aspect of the Kabbalah? And, and it's a very, very important part of the Kabbalah and the belief system, and it transcends out of Kabbalism and into other religions. I think that what happens with a lot of this knowledge of the earth is not all of it is, is false. I think there's truth and sometimes drafted for a bad cause. So whether it's good or it's evil, I think it makes sense that a planetary and a life system made by the omnipotent would have patterns that would work in sort of perfection and in order and not only at the measurable level but right back to the quantum level and in other dimensions so the difficulty though is is when we start to get into this is 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 any of that information corrupted or is it just being used to lead you in a direction that's away from God that you have to be careful of with. Mm -hmm. And I'll finish on the comment that it's also known as the planta plantagenista, uh, if I've got that right, plantagenista, which is also a term used by the Anjou and their junior offshoot, the Plantagene, Anjou being from the offspring of Anu in their belief system and their mythos. And the word gene in there um, is the gene of Anu and where the power sort of originates. And of course, you have to remember Kabbalism comes into Judaism from Sumeria and where the god Anu is. And so they, they sort of put that into one of their other trees called the tree of life, or we would know it as the genealogical tree, which is typically an elm tree, which is one of the most sacred uh, trees in, in, the, in the occult. And you have these different gene eologies, as in Plantagenista, and the gene of Isis, and the fairy gens, the Julie gens, and all the different genses that are out there. That's all sort of mixed into this, but that's that divine force that they're trying to tap into that comes into that tree of life that they're trying to develop within their inner self to become little gods. Mm 
sort of in a nutshell. Uh -huh. Now, to provide a little bit more context to the tree of life, let me bring it up here and try and give a little bit of what its meaning is uh, from top to bottom. All right. Now, I might say the words incorrect, so I apologize. The mukhath is the physical reality. The yasud is your dreams, subconscious. The netzak is the right brain and emotional flow. The hood is the left brain logic rules. The tabareth, again, I, 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 I may be pronouncing it incorrectly, but I do apologize. I want to just bring it out and, and, and shine some light on its meaning. Uh, so the tabareth is the mind and decision maker. The chesed or the chesed is generosity and growth. The gabara is the self-sacrifice to make room for new growth. The bena is the all potential ideas and archetypes. The hamak is the empty space in which all potential ideas and archetypes manifest. And the kither is the single point from which hakma anchors its space. So that's that explanation on that tree of life, on what it's supposed to mean, so that it is to my understanding. But I found something and found it very interesting on its planetary association. I said, ah, look at this. The kether is the crown. Manha is the understanding, right? Wisdom on the right, like I explained, but on the left, it's planets, Pluto, Saturn, Neptune, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, the sun, Mercury, Venus, moon, and Earth, all set up in the same way I just explained it. Interesting, a lot of magic is practiced on certain moons and planetary alignments, astrology. Question is... Like I said in the description, I am trying to explain that it was said that Moses spoke to God from his mouth to his ear. And that's where Kabbalah came from, that knowledge that was then passed on, which was not documented right away. To my understanding, it was documented later, which to me is not exactly what's in the Bible. Yes. So that being said, back to what you said, Gary. Are we being lied to? Was this a manifestation and creation by certain head priests for manifestation and communicating with demons and the fallen ones? Just saying and putting it out there. Thoughts, both of you to comment. Did you want me to I, start? Oh, go ahead. Sure, go right ahead. Um, I was going to say that, you know, like how I learned it, it, deals with authority and structure. So it does represent universally the planets as well as um, fallen angels. But you also have, like with each one, you have a representation of both what would be considered the positive and the negative. So you'd have both angels as well as, you know, fallen ones that are represented in that structure. And it shows forth their jurisdiction at the universal levels. Um, from my understanding, it's based off of kind of the core of the temple design that God gave Moses. So, you know, in that inner part, you have the ark with the three items. You know, what did he say around that, you know, that tabernacle? He structured it where you had the four priestly offices that would build their tents around that. And then you'd have the 12 tribes of Israel that built their tribe, you know, their tents around that kind of representing the storehouses as we see that you know the enemy has taken kind of the god's design and how he laid it out and replaced those 12 storehouses that represented the houses of israel with the zodiac uh so there's where you know you'd have both a positive where you've got you know you've got an angel that represents each of those 12 tribes that are represented there, but you also have the negative. So um, 
when you get into it, it, it can be quite elaborate. What do you think? Comments on that and that theory, like you said earlier, you said maybe angel fallen angels like is in the book of Enoch. And that's why I refrain back to how the explanation is where it came from, what it's said to have come from, but it was not written down immediately like the commandments in the Bible and so forth. Yeah. So it was written much later, which tells me it could have been a swindle. We could have been taken and it's not exactly from God. Why were they hiding this? Why was it not written right away? What were they plotting? And were they communicating with demonic forces? Yeah, so I mean, and, and in that, I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, I'll just mention that within that design, you can see all sorts of uh, sacred geometry in there, all sorts of shapes and signs that um, would also be associated with the occult. And you also have the seven wandering stars. Uh, of occultism that's also in there. I know they include the other planets that are not, but just so everybody knows there's a lot packed in there. And that they were considered, the uh, the people of Jewish mysticism were considered to be caretakers and guardians of divine knowledge. But in their belief system, this knowledge was uh, provided to chosen individuals to be those caretakers and then the organizations and the priesthoods that they set up after that. So in there's two portions to this history. One is, is the first portion was revealed to Adam that went on to his sons and including Cain, who developed the seven sacred sciences that merged with the... Uh, elicit knowledge from the gods or the fallen angels before the flood. Then you get this additional knowledge that is uh, provided to Moses in their belief system um, that they say was recorded. And they actually say it in their accounts, it's one of the three tablets that are in the Ark of the Covenant, verses two, that's biblically. But this other tablet's not really a tablet, it's more of a shatia or divine sapphire that is also known as the tablet of the destiny and it's said to have all the knowledge that ever was and all the knowledge that will ever be. And so this is the additional knowledge that is said to be provided to Moses in, 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 in Kabbalism. And that this knowledge comes from the watchers. Uh, fallen angels, mm -hmm. and that this is the illicit knowledge that was merged with the seven sacred sciences. And then if you sort of roll that forward to the post alluvian period, you get the mystery schools coming out of the polytheist religions that are developing the seven sacred sciences that were passed on by Hermes to Nimrod mm -hmm. to the post alluvian world. And now in this Kabbalistic tradition, and I think you get a similar accounting in the Essenic tradition from the Egyptian Therapeutate, is this knowledge of illicit knowledge is also downloaded into different types of knowledge storehouses, whether or not it's the Emerald Tablet, because they're all kind of considered the same type of knowledge base uh, for both sides of the religion and other cultures. So I think it's quite clear that uh, this is the knowledge that was chosen to give to the Canaanites in their mythical history or their mythos of it that they also received because they're part of that sort of divine inheritance of this knowledge. And so they're talking to maybe not the same angels because those ones are probably in the abyss, but in whether it's mystical Hebraic thought or monotheist, there's this Hebrew word called Saba for the host. There's a rebellious host on each side. There's a rebellious host and there's a loyal host, I should say, that has rank and order. So if ones are put into the abyss, not all of them were, these ones would rise up and they would do similar things, but maybe they're a little bit more restrained than just before the, uh, before the flood and just after the flood. Yeah. Do you feel like I know in the occult, like they bring out that, you know, a lot of this knowledge came from the the revelations when the Lord uh, gave Solomon wisdom. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, that's that receiving of that knowledge. And that's where they sort of take it back to Solomon's time, which sort of predates the Kabbalistic period. Mm -hmm. But the Essenes were around at that time. 
and the Essenes That's are true. the third sort of major group of Judaism who also called themselves watchers or guardians of this knowledge and that the word comes from, you know, Natsar uh, versus uh, Kabul. And uh, Natsar, you know, is, is the Hebrew word um, to uh, describe, to watch, guard, or keep, and preserve, and keep a secret, a watchman, and that mm -hmm. the Essenes believe they got this knowledge from the fallen angels as well. And they take their religion back to the therapeutic of Egypt that they say Moses brought back with them. And monotheism is the rogue cult. Polytheism mm -hmm. is the root cult. And that, that explains why this hidden knowledge that Moses received has been protected and not, or not, Protect, it has been protected by them, but also eliminated from the monotheist corrupted accounts. Hmm. Now, I want to get into the other side of this, very important, which is the black magic side of it. Because one side, they talk about secrecy from the mouth of God to Moses and how they was going to lift your spirits, give them wisdom or knowledge. But I, it seems to be much darker than that. Wherever you look, it seems like the Kabbalah, is used in ritual magic, communication, and ceremonies. So black magic, the dark side of Kabbalah. I want to play a quick video. And this rabbi explains something, and very interesting. Um, I'm going to play it. I want everyone to take a listen. This is uh, Rabbi Simon Jacobson. He's very good. I credit him for this. Uh, he just touches on it briefly. I want you to listen very, very carefully. Here it is. Is there a dark side to the mystical experience, to the spiritual experience? The dark side of Kabbalah, black magic. We hear about sorcery, the occult. Throughout history, this has been discussed, shamanism, witchery, And other forms, and I'm not just talking about sleight of hand and magic, but actually forms of experiences that people associate that lead them to another place. Is there a dark side to that? And today as well, I just remember, as it comes to mind, a few years ago, invited to someone's home, and there was a guru there. People that I saw when I drove up, a driveway filled with Rolls Royces, the most expensive cars. I walk in. Yes, this is man sitting on the floor, and he has his beloved followers and disciples literally worshiping him. And I felt a vibe that was not, uh, I will call it, a healthy vibe. We started a conversation. I was invited. I wasn't even sure what the agenda was, but I was invited just to uh, speak. But then I realized that the people who invited me wanted me to help get some people out of this cult. And it was definitely something was wrong. Now, this man was brilliant and sensitive. But I felt a certain, it was his ego. Did it get to him? Did he justify behavior in the name of some higher spiritual state? And it was then that I came to discover, and I'm not going to go through the graphic details, but it was quite sorted, let's put it this way. I realized firsthand that there's a very thin line between spirituality, sensuality, and sexuality. And if you don't know how to straddle that line, if you don't know how to uh, navigate, boundaries can be crossed in ways that create quite a lot of damage. Interesting what he says, how you'll see certain rabbis and those powerful priests and so forth. And I mention this because those who are watching take heed. You'll see a lot of people on national television in certain positions of power. Um, uh, evangelists and so forth. Uh, and I won't get into so many names because we're on YouTube, but we'll talk about it on the after show. And they take this power and they use it and abuse it all in the name of God. 
And this is something that's absolutely unbelievable. And it seems that very famous, powerful people are using this to control these other people in many ways and implementing some type of magic. Let's talk about this. Kerry, you go first. Thoughts on what his comments and what he had to say. Yeah, he didn't quite go right to the edge in terms yeah. of these dark forces that he was feeling. Um, but it's not unusual, and it's the sort of constitutive thing that one of the things that is part of polytheist religions is there are there's good magic, there's black magic, there's good ones, there's evil ones, but they're all part of the same worship of a pantheon of God. So it's all within sort of a micro thing that's sort of within polytheism and we have good and evil on in the bible but we worship one god and we understand those who oppose that god as being evil and so they have nuances to those sort of meanings on the other side now as they dip into this powerful magic that is part of that illicit knowledge from heaven that we talked about is that they have the ability to control things that would seem almost preternatural. Um, I don't think they we've seen or witnessed some of the major things that may have been done in the past, but we may be starting to see that as, as, as we roll forward. So anytime you're opening up portals to uh, this arena of spirits, and you're not testing those spirits. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't ask you to open up a portal to spirits, period. Pray directly <laughs> to God. <laughs> but at least you have to be testing who those spirits are and who they're mm -hmm. from. Because th they're both there, whether they're doing it in a nice way and in a sweet mm -hmm. way, or they're being in a sort of aggressive, take your body over sort of position, their agenda is the same. And if you have that presence that's influencing, how can you manage those things as a rabbi was talking about in terms of the th things that you need to be able to manage? They're supposed to offer that knowledge to be able to do it, to give you reason over the knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I don't see it ever really being mastered. Agreed. Jesse, thoughts on this? I guess I would question... Um... The, the mastery, but I think that the difference in that is, you know, again, people who are using that as a form of, you know, magic where they're stepping outside of God's will, they're trying to make it happen. You know, scripture uses a word procuring. They're trying to procure it for themselves. And when they do that, you know, what are they doing? You know, they're entering that quantum level of magic, which is, you know, entangling with something outside of God. And that's exactly what they're doing at those, you know, spiritual gateways is, is they're entertaining and tangling with something that's not the Holy Spirit of God. And it's not meant to be used that way. Mm -hmm. You know, all of creation is meant to display the glory of God and the beauty and the majesties of God. And we're meant to rejoice and enter into that place of fellowship with him through those things. Um, but that can only be, you know, when you're in that right relationship with God. So, you know, that's where I guess I would maybe redefine that mastery that, you know, I do believe that individuals who are in that right relationship with God can be in that place where, you know, we have charge of his house. We have charge of his courts. You know, we begin to understand things as he created and made them to be in function. Um, but it, it can be very scary because, you know, as you're getting into that, um, you know, it opens that door of that form of godliness. And that would really be the best way to, you know, kind of define those who engage in this stuff is that there's always that form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. You know, again, they're trying to make it till they fake it till they make it. Um, you know, but I think that's the key is when you see, you know, and, and that form of godliness can be such a fine line. You know, I think of how many pastors, how many churches where you grow up 
You know, I mean, they, they can preach it. They're, they're giving you a sermon that, you know, has pieces of scripture that you're like, yes, that spoke to me. I feel the power of God in that. You know, how many politicians get up there and use the Psalms or other forms of scripture? Yet, how many of them really are using those Psalms as a curse? They're, they're using Psalm magic against us and, and we don't even know it. We think, oh my goodness, they know scripture so well. <laughs> um, yet, they really don't. You know, the truth is they don't. And there's, you know, there's no relationship of God there. It's an incredible unbelievable time in history. And I wanted to play that because this ancient esoteric mysticism, th th this Kabbalah uh, now being used in Hollywood and so forth, now famous rabbis, famous, and I don't want to get into their names, are extremely pushing the dark side, the evil side of Kabbalah. And I'm... I, you guys know I spent hours and hours and so much work to put a show like this together and research and try to combine it within an hour. And there are so many different testimonies. One specifically I had to share with everybody. So this is someone who studies the Kabbalah and um, he, he studies the scripture. Uh, and he had this to say about what he's hearing and what's happening today. Take a look. I don't want to mention names, but a couple of months ago, someone sent me a message, a video of one of the most famous teachers of Kabbalah today, very not righteous, a really not righteous man, very, very disappointing, very scary, very dark, hating the sages, hating the Torah, hating the innocent way of beautiful, honest, simple Judaism, like hating it, despiting the, the beauty of the sweetness of the Torah and Jewish life, and only desiring the false methods of the dark secrets and, and the names, the Kabbalistic codes and numeral values. It's like dark and spooky and, and, and evil and very bad, very bad. That's what is happening today. It's all coming out. And a lot of leaders in churches, ministers, rabbis are all, I believe, going to show their true colors. I believe this is the time we're all going to see it. So it's important that we talk about this and, and careful with who we put our trust in. Jesse, we'll start with you. Thoughts on this gentleman's comments on what's happening and how things are starting to unravel. I, you know, I definitely see it, uh, particularly in certain movements. Uh, we see a lot of individuals who are seeking after, you know, the numerology, the uh, gematria. They, they want to understand, but again, you know, they're just focused on that knowledge. Um, what's interesting is that you do get a lot of individuals who are claiming to be Christian. They're claiming, you know, to be in the word of God. Um, yet I see more of, you know, where they're focused on, on those basic things without, you know, really talking a lot about that relationship with Christ. And you have to ask, like, you know, why are we trying to discern the times, the seasons, events when the Lord and his word already gives us all that information. And, I, you know, I have to say it in some ways, like these forms of Kabbalah have become, people use them like an oracle where, they, you know, they're trying to divine things, gain knowledge. Um, and it, you know, how far is that? It's a fine line from divination and sorcery. Gary thoughts on the black magic, the dark side of Kabbalah, and how rabbis, priests, evangelists are all coming out with this uh, dark intention. Their true colors are starting to be seen. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, absolutely, because th they think they're heading into a period of great change, and you know we would understand as the end time. So they're going to become more visible. You know, the first, you know, the writers of like the Zohar and other. Uh, interpretations of the Bible as they come out uh, over over time, 
they're said to be written by wizards and sorcerers. And we know what the Bible says about that. And those, that's the same language that's used in the book of Enoch about the illicit knowledge that's being provided that merges with those seven sacred sciences. And then what they start to do with that, that brings about the first apocalypse. So if it's going to be like the days of Noah, one expects you're going to see something akin to that because nothing is new under the sun. What was will be again. So we're going to we're going to be seeing that as it as it comes forward, and that this knowledge that they are utilizing for a specific goal mm -hmm. um, is something that is tied into the larger whole things that are going on around the world today. Uh, we have Kabbalism in terms of we understand it in the West, and it's sort of tied in, if you look at the Thelemic tree, mm -hmm. into Rosicrucianism. Mm -hmm. If you want to take that a little bit older, you can make, take some of the families up to the Committee of 300 or even the 33, the grafting of, of the bloodlines. And they're into this alchemy. They're into this sorcery. And we have to understand that Babylon is going to deceive the world through her sorceries. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's specific languages, and, and, and of course, that's pharmacia. But I mean, you see that alchemy coming into that, which is part of the Kabbalistic sciences, as just as it's mm -hmm. part of the uh, occult sciences. So, all of this is going to be coming out in a larger way, and, and more and more people are making themselves known visibly that they are mystics and specifically Kabbalists mm -hmm. and that that's the true meaning of the Bible. That's also part of how you start to lead people away and discredit the Bible for the end time. So when they start coming mm -hmm. out with this additional information that they say they have, that's going to be a powerful mixture. These are people in power and influence. And I, I pose this question to both you and all our viewers. Are they using Kabbalah as a cover to get away with what they do? To say, hey, I'm a righteous man or woman. Hey, I'm a religious person. Hey, I follow the Torah or these books. You know, I want to study. Are they hiding behind it? We must be very careful with who we trust and who believe. Like it says in the Bible, they will be wolves in sheep's clothing in places of power and might, and you shall be deceived. And something I seem to see everywhere in Hollywood is the red bracelet. Ah, the red bracelet, everybody. You've seen many celebrities wear this, those in power and influence. That's Ashton Kutcher, by the way. That's Britney Spears. I have tons and tons more. Oh, who is that? That's Tucker Carlson, by the way. The red bracelet of the Kabbalah. What's it meaning? What, what's its purpose? Are, is it just them showing that they're studying the Kabbalah and they're students of this ancient esoteric uh, um, knowledge? They're, they're studying it. They want to learn it. What are your thoughts on this? Let's begin with uh, Gary. Yeah, I'm not all that familiar with the red bracelet, but it certainly fits in with the MO. So they want to be able to communicate with others and show things in plain sight uh, for people. And they know full well that most people don't understand their symbols and their communication tools. So you have to be very careful of, of people who are wearing those types of symbols and or other symbolisms or ways that they might communicate and really analyze what they're saying. Are they talking in double entendres? Are they talking in allegories? Are they trying to, in, uh, are they trying to uh, reimagine scripture? That's one of their great languages and their code words is how do you reimagine things? Um, and that's because they're part of the interpretive approach and you have to be, and adapt to understand the communications of whatever they're trying to, to communicate. But if they're carrying a message, whether it's through entertainment, whether it's through news, where, wherever they're located, you're, so to speak, to use the same term, your red flag ought to go up mm -hmm. against those symbols and say, 
I don't know whether they're telling me the truth, but I better verify what the agenda is and what they're really trying to say. Now, I got more context to this from my experience, but Jesse, I want to let you touch on this. Thoughts on this red bracelet of the uh, Kabbalists that are studying, that are in Hollywood. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with Gary. You know, it can represent so many things within the system. Um, you know, whether it's the scarlet cord that Rahab hung from her window that represented, you know, that belief that she, you know, she was set aside for salvation. Um, to, you know, you look at the ribbons that they, the system will use, uh, that they put out on altars that represent a contract with the spirit of lust or Leviathan. Um, you know, it can represent so many different things. And, you know, we have to be careful. We can't just go and do um, what we see everybody else doing, joining in. You know, we're beyond that point. Uh, we can't act in ignorance. And I think, you know, we need to be wise about what we do. And, uh, you know, how do we begin to minister to a world that, you know, is very materialistic and they they want that imagery, they want that display you know, they want people to see their beliefs. But what's interesting is they want that visible sign that they believe in something, but they don't want to actually really like live it out. You know, they don't want to live through the hardness or the struggles that they have in their relationship with God or display that to the world. You know, they just want this outward symbol that represents what they believe. You know, it's so strange, and I, I pieced it together here. So let me just look at, show you. This, there's a meaning behind this, folks. The red string is worn around the wrist. It's most recognizable sign of the Kabbalah movement. Again, the Kabbalah movement. It's often worn on the left wrist. Listen to me now. Those occultists that are watching this show know exactly where I'm going with this because I'm trying to get you out and save you from this world. Listen, the left wrist, and it is said to ward off any evil and misfortune that could be caused by the evil eye. So here's what I say to that. Ha! Because anyone who studies the occult knows about the left-hand path. And if you study the left-hand path, that's the magic. It's the left, the left side. That goes much deeper, okay, uh, biblically, and I don't want to get into it uh, with uh, the Garden of Eden and how they were. Let me just say this. The left hand, and when you're studying the left hand path, is when you're actually working with demons. You're starting to study the Goetia. You're starting to deal with the Lesser Keys of Solomon, your Solomonic magic, and you're making packs with demons here, folks. The left-hand path. Now, that's what I studied. So I don't know. Maybe some of you need to shed the light on me because you might know more. If the left-hand path is associated with demonic energies and packs with demons, why would the Kabbalah tell you to wear a bracelet on the same side of the hand that's associated with demons? To say you're going to wear off evil spirits. I ain't buying it, but I'd like to get your take on it for both of you. Please and thank you. I'm just wondering, are they seeing the hand as a portal and they think maybe that red string is going to keep a demon from coming through? <laughs> I don't know. Gary? Yeah, yeah, I think it's... Uh, I think it's important to them. <laughs> whether or not <laughs> whether or not it actually has any impact but you know it has all of those other values that, that we're talking about but when you talk mm -hmm. about the left hand and you talk about that red band as it connects back to the lower keys of solomon that you're talking about and understanding that the occult drafts most of the patriarchs including king solomon as and he was one of the greatest black magicians ever in the occult belief system uh, and that his wisdom was the wisdom of Egypt and the wisdom of, you know, what uh, Moses had been initiated into and the seven sciences and the illicit knowledge of the therapeutate. Um, he's also in their 
mythos thought to have discovered the seven sacred sciences when he was excavating for the temple in that mystical history and received power through that as well. And so you have a lot of meanings that can get sort of tied and go a whole bunch of different sort of directions. But I, I kind of think when you, in, and this is just my speculation, I kind of think when you do a wrist of a specific color in a specific location in jewelry and things like that, you are showing a loyalty to a, a specific stream or branch of that belief system as one of those members. And I, and again, I haven't seen or understood the red bracelet before, but that would be typically what they're really trying to tell you who they're with and what they're doing. And which is why you need to put up those analytical um, spidey senses, so to speak, so that you, you, you really understand who you're dealing with, but they're becoming way more visible by the looks of things. And so that must mean a certain higher level of the hierarchy that they're a major representative of. And uh, they're hoping to maybe bring in more into the movement based on that as well. Mm -hmm. So I there you have it. Yep. I mean, yeah. this is very simple. Um, it's very simple. And I believe there it's more dark than it is light. Mind you, some people will, will, will try and stay in the light. But from what I'm seeing from this Kabbalah, it is a lot more dark and dark magic and people are using it in evil ways to manifest things for their own desire uh, and their own here's the word we need to watch for ego we need to watch for false prophets and and those uh that are wolves in sheep's clothing um again now there's some people gonna be in my chat trying to stick up for those celebrities yeah. wearing red bracelets yeah. i ain't buying it thanks for coming out it's been a slice yeah. i ain't buying I would it I would say one more thing on that, uh, yeah. and, it, and it just sort of, I forgot about this connection, but the mystical Judaic movement is closely tied to the Sibylline oracular belief system. So when you start connecting into the false prophets and into the end time, there's a connection there as well. And maybe that's part of the whole thing that, hmm. they're, that they're working with here. Well, we know that we that's are cool. apparently the so-called end times or what they're trying to implement. And we've discussed timelines and so forth. This is supposed to be organic, always on God's time, not man's time. Man could think they're going to push it and want it to be manifested and, and, and get you to um, submit to it and then accept it. Remember, you must accept it. And in a cohesive consciousness, billions of people agree to it, they want to manifest that. This is manifestation. This goes to magic. I know the tricks in all their games. I'm going to tell you. I am buying it. And I believe that the Lord is giving us discernment to figure them out, to figure out this code. And when I mean code, I mean what they're trying to hide from us. So that we do not obey. We do not submit. We do not give permission. We do not give blessing or authority to them over our lives and our soul. I believe in the Lord God Almighty and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who took me out of the dark ways to put me on the right path. And I will spread that truth far and wide to open people's eyes. Nothing is what it seems, ladies and gentlemen. Everything is a game. And they paint this beautiful little picture, whether it's the movies, whether it's music, whether it's fashion, whether it's TV, whether it's video games, every aspect of society in our planet has been corrupted Fact. Now we begin the rebuild. Have faith and glory in God. Our time is coming. I truly believe that. Now we've come to about an hour that we've been doing this show. And I hope everyone took a little bit out of it. So before we sign off, let me pass it to Jesse first. Anything else you'd like to add, Jesse? And please let everybody know how they could follow and support your ministry. Absolutely. I agree, you know, now is the time that we need to really contend for the faith and, you know, that being our belief in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you know, we're seeing, unlike any other time, more false prophets, more false Christ arising, and more false gospels. 
Um, you know, there is nothing more important, no weapon more valuable than your scripture. And, you know, learning how to read, how to, you know, pray through, how to wrestle through that, you know, that's how we grow in the faith. And scripture says that, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, you know, not letting the enemy take that from us. Um, you know, I encourage people to uh, follow my other website, Kingdom Living with Jesse. On there, I've got a lot of videos. I've got a lot of courses, uh, my books that are focused on, you know, teaching us how to really live that new life that we have in Christ. How do we begin to understand the authority that we've been given? You know, when scripture says we have new life, what does that look like? How do we begin to live that? And how do we walk out a relationship with the Lord God Almighty um, in a way where, you know, it's everything that he's desiring it to be as well as what we desire it to be you know based on righteousness faith um goodness and you know obedience and loving the lord so i encourage people to look into that and i'll hand it over to gary yeah i would uh i would throw one other thing in there for people to put into their mix in terms of the uh, uh rise of uh Gnosticism, which was really sort of connected in the time of Jesus to, uh, with the Essene movement, the Kabbalist movement, uh, and the Mendeans and the Sabians. And that that word Mendean, which is also a language where Medea comes out of, means heavenly knowledge. And that they called their priests the Nazareans and the Mendeans were a branch of the Essene movement. And so none of those words come from Nazareth that they like to uh, sort of uh, draft as being the early Christians and try and convince Christians they were, they were, they were as such. But this heavenly law knowledge came from the angels that they would not provide the names of even upon torture and death. So you have to understand there's a lot of darkness there. Yes, they'll portray the dualism of white and dark but it's the same pantheon. There you go, guys. Again, we appreciate you guys being here. A lot of work, effort, and energy is put into producing these shows. The month of October will be a blockbuster month. We will be bringing back Gary to discuss a few things. I have a psychic, formerly a psychic, um, who got out of that world and found Jesus Christ, was saved. So we want to talk about astrology, especially coming into reading the moons and the stars uh, in the month of October. I'm working on a few other special guests. Tony Spera from the Occult Museum, the Warren Occult Museum in Connecticut. Going to talk about some of the most haunted items that he has um, acquired. And um, he's got a big event coming up. Uh, and we're also looking at discussing... Ah, it's, it's so crazy. So much is going on. Um, exorcisms. And we touched on it briefly, but I'm looking at bringing on an actual exorcist right here to the reveal report to talk about this stuff. The month of October is a wild month, guys. So lots of guests, lots of shows going on. Uh, we are on Telegram. We are on Twitter. And don't forget, we are on Patreon. Coming up next, guys, all three of us will be live for a Q&A. And we're going to give you a chance to ask questions to Jesse, myself, or Gary about whatever you'd like. So join Patreon in the link below. And if you enjoyed yourselves and you like the content we bring to you every single Friday on the Reveal Report here on YouTube, show us some love by going to PayPal and making a, um, a gift, a donation. It helps in every way, shape, or form. Again, thanks you all for watching. Get outside, get some fresh air, get some vitamin D. We appreciate all the love and support. And we hope to see you next Friday night or join us on Patreon coming up next right after this for a great Q&A talk. Thanks for watching. God bless and good night.